Hello and welcome to Chewing It Over and it is me today Jack March from rheumatology.physio and we are doing rheumatology takeover. I'm hoping that all the streams are loading. I can see that we've got a live audience just ticking up on the screen in front of me here and um, I am also um, attempting to live stream through my Instagram account via my phone which Anybody watching on Facebook, et cetera, won't be able to see, but it's just in front of me here. So apologies, anybody on Instagram, if I'm not looking at you and it's all a bit weird, because uh, it is a slightly different angle. Um, I've had a lovely message in from uh, Mehmet, who said I'm handsome today. So um, maybe his screen is cracked or something. So what we're going to be talking about today is COVID-19 and rheumatology conditions. There's been a couple of things floating around social media um, atmosphere recently and um, as a result I just wanted to comment on it to make sure that we're not over exaggerating what's happening but also we're making sure we keep an eye on uh, progress as well and what's happening within the rheumatology community the MSK community and all the other associated um, locations that we need to be worrying about COVID-19 and these rheumatology conditions. So I do want to put um, anybody, put any questions for me into the chat function um, and I'll try and get to as many of those as I can or any comments that you have as well, um, then please do let me know and we'll try and get to those. So the first thing that I want to um, sort of point out and mention to people about this is that um, we've had, there was a, um, a letter to the editor published um, a few weeks ago now um, by um, Fiona Koth, uh, apologies if I mispronounced her name, James Mackay and um, the obviously wonderful Carl Gaffney. And they, um, it was a case report about um, an axial presentation of reactive arthritis secondary to COVID-19 infection. So there's a couple of things that I want to point out in this, um, this case report. Um, and this was basically a 53 year old gentleman who um, developed axial spondyloarthritis symptoms following um, COVID-19 infection. And uh, from there on went with a fairly classical picture. We don't need to go into too much detail there uh, with regards to what that looked like. But a few things that um, really strike out to me that um, I've seen a couple of comments at Twitter mostly, but um, that's where I spend most of my time anyway on social media. A couple of comments about um, whether COVID-19 is going to increase the amount of um, inflammatory conditions that we're seeing, um, whether it's de a definitive trigger for these uh, rheumatology conditions. And uh, one thing that I want to just caution everybody on at the moment is that I don't think we're quite as far along our understanding of that as maybe we could be um, to make such definitive statements. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, and um, also how this might differ from your normal presentations of um, things like axial spondyloarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, because there are going to be differences if it is a true trigger from corona uh, from the coronavirus um, because people will technically develop a reactive arthritis or most people will develop a reactive arthritis and those um those symptoms and presentations and also demographics are slightly different to the ones that we would expect through a regular axial spondyloarthritis patient so for example this is a very nice case study that demonstrates that so you would normally um, suggest in axial spondyloarthritis that um, symptoms should onset before the age of 45. It is a young person's disease. And as we said a few minutes ago, this patient was 53 years old. So first symptoms of, an inf of axial spondyloarthritis at the age of 53, incredibly unusual, if not incredibly rare. And um, this chap is older. And that's because he's not developing what we would class a true axial spondyloarthritis. He is developing a reactive arthritis, which um, looks like axial spondyloarthritis. So it probably would come under the umbrella of axial spondyloarthritis, but it is a different subtype to something like ankylosing spondylitis, radiographic spondylitis, etc. So immediately once we start to look at this, then things are going to be slightly different. So if we stick with our inflammatory um, spinal issues for the second, then um, 
as I said, we would normally be looking at um, under the age of 45, um, roughly the same number as men versus women getting getting the disease, uh, predominantly spinal symptoms, severe stiffness in the morning, pain worse in the morning, better with activity and not improved with rest. Whereas with our reactive arthritis patients, we have a significantly more, uh, significantly higher number of men. Um, it usually presents uh, between the age of 20 and 40, but we have a less definitive um, range there. So where we said it would present with onset below the age of 45, reactive arthritis doesn't really have such a cutoff. Um, and it is more men. The reason that we quote those sorts of um, details is that with reactive arthritis, usually, if we ignore COVID-19 for a second, usually it's related to um, gastroenteritis, influenza, and um, some sexually transmitted infections. And men tend to be at a higher risk of developing those than women are, and younger men especially. So we would usually be seeing it in that cohort. Whereas obviously with these COVID-19 patients, we're seeing across the spectrum, all the way up to uh, much older patients, um, and, um, and obviously younger patients as well. The other thing that we're going to be looking at that's going to be slightly different, these reactive arthritis patients tend to have a um, slightly less obvious disease process. They tend to have a slightly uh, lower grade presentation than um, when you see an axial spondyloarthritis patient. Um, so what I mean by that is that they don't always tick as many boxes as you would expect for an axial spondyloarthritis patient. And it tends to be sort of they get some stiffness, but it doesn't necessarily last for a significant long, long period of time. Maybe it doesn't quite react to anti-inflammatories like you might expect. Um, maybe they don't wake in the night. Maybe they don't get peripheral symptoms. These sorts of things, it, it becomes a bit more of a muddy picture than it than it usually does, especially in men with, um, with a true axial spondyloarthritis. So we do have to be careful. Um, but what we would then see instead is this clear uh, association with the COVID-19 infection. So um, it, usually within two weeks, you would have, uh, so you'd have, let's say you, you develop your COVID-19 infection, um, and then two weeks later, you would start off with these um, spondylitis symptoms or, uh, or rheumatoid arthritis symptoms would be another, another case that might occur. So um, we do need to be careful with that. So anybody who is coming through with potentially um, any inflammatory type symptoms, we do need to be asking them whether they've been exposed to corona virus or COVID-19, whether they've had any tests, um, whether um, they had a positive test, especially within a short period of time um, within the development of their symptoms. So it does bring an interesting flavor to, um, to our assessments here. So one thing that I think we do need to be aware of at the moment is that infective onset reactive arthritis um, does occur. And as we talked about in, in more in a younger male population than any other, but usually that's because those infections are more limited to that, those populations. Whereas these COVID-19 infections are significantly widespread. So, the question then becomes, OK, is this going to start triggering reactive arthritis in patients we don't normally see it? And the answer to that is probably. And I've, I have been saying this for about 18 months since we started. 18 months, that's far too, uh, far too predicted of me, predictive of me. Probably a year I've been saying this, that this might occur. Um, but how many more is the real question? I think we have no real, um, no real way of assessing at the moment, and I think this will be borne out over time um, as rheumatologists and um, um, researchers look at it. But um, I'm not sure how many more we will be getting at the moment. I think it's just something we need to be aware of can occur. So I think the thing is, is that um, when we look in the younger populations, it's probably going to be triggering those patients to develop an axial spondyloarthritis who may well have been triggered to get room to uh, sorry reactive arthritis anyway um, so they were just for want of a better phrase waiting to get the triggering infection when we look at these older patients and this chap in the in the, in the uh, case study the letter to the editor was 53 then i think you would potentially then consider that an extra um development of, of an inflammatory condition that wouldn't actually have happened 
So we may well get some more, but it may just be into these older populations. So it's an interesting, um, interesting thing to be be considering. So when when we start to think about this, if you're working in a first contact practitioner clinic, private clinic, NHS, then you do need to be understanding that they may not fit these rigid criteria that um, that that we usually might might apply. Um, so it's a really interesting time for this, and um, I think one of the things that I really want people to um, take away from today as well uh, this live stream especially is you need to be understanding what's going to be putting people at risk for developing these um, especially the axial spondyloarthritis symptoms um, but also the peripheral ones like rheumatoid so um, in this case study this patient was HLA B27 uh, positive um, so he would have been at a much higher risk of developing an axial spondyloarthritis compared to someone who is um, HLA B27 negative. He had, as we talked about, managed to get past that sort of magic number of age of 45 without having developed it and then has gone on to develop it. So real, um, real change in process there for him. So what we're going to be looking at is, um, so in axial patients, we're going to be looking at HLA B27 related conditions. So we're talking um, uveitis and iritis, we're talking psoriasis, we're talking uh, Crohn's and colitis. So patients with those kinds of histories are more likely to develop, to develop an axial spondyloarthritis. They get the um, COVID-19 infection. And then they, that's what then triggers them to go on to develop this reactive arthritis. So you need to be making those clinical reasoning approaches because, of course, some people will just develop a axial spondyloarthritis by pure coincidence with regards to their corona, corona um, infection because it is that widespread. Um, so those are the sorts of things we're looking at in axial uh, presentation patients when you're looking peripherally then really we're looking a bit more specific so again you might look at psoriasis um, depending on the presentation of the joints um, so somebody who's presenting with multiple tendinopathies you would probably look more at psoriasis but obviously with joint swelling as well um, but then with regards to rheumatoid arthritis then we're looking for a much more specific um, history of rheumatoid arthritis or maybe polymyalgia rheumatica in their family and um, then them going on to develop MCP joint swelling, um, MTP joint swelling um, or even um, single joint um, issues. So I would be less concerned in those peripheral patients about them having HLA B27 related conditions but um, I would, I, you've still got to be really quite confident you're ruling some of those things out when faced with someone with an inflammatory process. So it is a really interesting time for these. They're, they're certainly not easy. I've had a few in clinic over time and they don't present particularly obviously and especially if they come in a few months, even a year down the line. And I wonder whether we're going to see the increase that we're going to see in 6, 12, 18 months time rather than now. Um, we've got lots of issues at the moment with COVID-19, people not accessing healthcare for a variety of reasons. Um, and we know that delays to diagnosis in these axial conditions are anywhere uh, up to eight and a half years um, already. So, you know, I think there is going to be this delay as things go forward. So when someone turns up into your clinic, then I really do want to be making sure that everybody is being vigilant for these and making sure they're aware of what this can present like um, and what you need to do with them. They do need to be in rheumatology for further investigations. They do need to be um, investigated properly and made sure that this isn't what is causing their, their axial symptoms. Um, so I've had a question on Instagram, actually. So apologies to anybody watching on the live stream here. I just need to scroll back on Instagram. It came from uh, came from my good friend Gronya, um, and um, I, I, I will resist to read this out in an Irish accent for you, Gronya. But um, if bloods for inflammatory markers come back clear, are we confidently ruling out axial spondyloarthritis or not? So this is where it gets really difficult. So. When we talk about axial spondyloarthritis and investigations, there are a lot of false negatives. So um, we've got a good percentage, anywhere up to 40% of axial spondyloarthritis patients aren't going to have raised inflammatory markers when you test them. When we move into reactive arthritis, as I mentioned, it is a often, not always, but often a lower grade disease. So they, their inflammatory markers don't increase significantly. So in this case, I've got the, uh, I've got it up in front of me here, actually. Um, the 
uh, lab investigation showed it a CRP of only 13. Um, so while that is raised above five, it's not up 40, 50, 60. It's not a huge elevation. Imagine that patient came into you um, with, uh, with a cold or um, they came in uh, stress, they've not been sleeping appropriately, then um, you may well attribute a, a, a CRP of 13 to that, in all honesty. Um, or if they've got other comorbidities, imagine that patient has diabetes, imagine that patient has um, some other thing that may keep their CRP slightly raised. So in all honesty, you, I wouldn't be investigating these patients significantly. If you are su suspicious that they have an inflammatory component to their spinal pain, um, or their spinal symptoms, then we need to be referring them into rheumatology for further investigations. There are some caveats to that. Depending on your local pathways, you may need blood results to get them into the rheumatology pathways, um, and that is going to vary locally. I know I sit in between about um, three CCGs and the pathways all vary for each one for how you access uh, those rheumatology departments. Um, so what we're really looking for, rather than these investigations with bloods and MRIs and stuff for therapists, for first contact practitioners, private, et cetera. Um, then what we're looking for is those symptomatic reports. Um, so we're looking at um, spinal stiffness, especially in the morning, lasting longer than 30 minutes. We're looking for the pain to be worse first thing in the morning. Symptoms not improved by rest, but improved by activity. Um, improvement with anti-inflammatories um, and waking in the second half of the night. Um, with symptoms that mean they've got to get out of bed and move around. And then, of course, um, that family history we talked about. So that family history of HLA-B27, positive conditions or related to, to positive conditions. So psoriasis, Crohn's colitis, I should say Crohn's and colitis, not the same disease, is it? Uh, Crohn's and colitis, um, uveitis, iritis, um, and of course, oh, obviously axial spondyloarthritis as well. So um, that's what we really need to be looking at. And, you know, I am a bit like a stuck record anyway. Um, I advocate for asking a lot of these questions with every back pain patient sub 45 anyway, to make sure you're clearing the possibility of it being inflammatory related. Um, but we're going to have to extend that out a little bit with, um, as I mentioned, these potentially older patients developing these conditions. Um, we can't say, OK, this patient's 60. Uh, I don't need to worry so much about um, a spondylitis. I don't need to worry about inflammatory back pain so much. That's lower down my 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 clinical reasoning. It, unfortunately, with these reactive arthritis patients, they that's going to remain within your reasoning. So you have to follow this process where you um, you identify the potential for this these symptoms to be inflammatory. You've then got to go backwards and you go, okay, are these symptoms potentially um, coinciding with a COVID-19 infection? Yes, no, maybe. Um, are there, is there, or is there a history of these HLA-B27 related conditions, either in the patient or in the family history? Um, in which case, that's where you're starting to build this clinical picture as to what you're going to do with this patient and whether you need to refer them into rheumatology. Like I said, at the moment, I really can't say whether we're going to get a significant increase of patients coming through. My suspicion is many of these patients would have developed an axial spondyl arthritis anyway um, because they were at risk of developing one so those younger cohorts is probably not going to be an increase it maybe it will be an earlier onset but maybe not an increase it's these older patients that normally would have got past the age of 45 um, and not developed it that are then going to develop it into these older older ages um, and i think that's where we're really going to have to keep our eye open because normally we wouldn't be doing that with those uh, with those older patients we would normally be lower down our clinical reasoning list so we've really got to stay vigilant for that the good thing with these reactive arthritis patients is often they go into remission um, if they're picked up early. Um, so once that infective um, process reduces down, um, then a good number of them do go into remission. But some of them do go on to develop issues in the long term. And of course, like with all of the other rheumatology conditions, the earlier we pick them up, uh, the better their outcomes are across the board. Um, I was what, reading some research recently and literally everything you can think of uh, from quality of life to work status to pain to medication use to imaging use is all improved if you pick these patients up early and refer them appropriately.
So um, that's something that you really want to get on top of is understanding that process. How do I refer these patients? You don't want to be scrabbling around, especially if you're in a quite a, um, a time poor process or time poor location, then like first contact practitioner clinics, for example, um, then you don't want to be scrabbling around with the patient going, okay, I need to find out what bloods I need to order to get you onto the appropriate pathway. You need that to hand so you, are, so you understand what you're what you're referring for, what you're investigating for, how you make that referral. You don't want to be having to bring the patient back to do that or some other logistical problem. Um, so it's something you do need to get in, in into, uh, into practice. So I'm hoping all that has made sense to everybody. Um, I'm just looking at Instagram. I haven't had any more questions come through on Instagram. Good, good lot of people watching. So I'm really pleased that everybody's decided to tune in to me today. Um, there are plenty of uh, more resources on on my website so if you head to rheumatology.physio then there's a blog there with lots of uh, lots of free resources there's a shop as well with things that you can you can purchase to uh, increase your clinical reasoning there isn't a lot on reactive arthritis i have to admit this is something that i'm coming to uh, more recently as we um, as we as these covid-19 infections increase um, and hopefully we'll start to dip off now so um, with any with any luck we shouldn't have to be worrying about this too much um, as we move into the future. Um, I've got a comment here from um, uh, from Anna. Good, uh, Anna, I'm on, on uh, the Massage Collective's podcast on Friday as well. So thank you, Anna, for tuning in. She said it's very useful. Um, I do hope that um, everybody's sort of taken away what I'm trying to push across here. It's not something that I want people to be significantly worried about and thinking, God, these are going to be coming into clinics all over the place. Um, I don't think it's going to be that significant. I think a lot of those patients you would be expecting to pick up anyway at some point. But um, I do want people to be vigilant. And if it's not something that's on your radar um, as now, then it, as I always say, then it is something that should be on your radar. Um, so I do want people to be making sure they screen patients who are coming in with back pain, especially anything that might be inflammatory related. So um, thank you very much for tuning in with me today. Do, like I say, head to my uh, website, rheumatology.physio. You can find all sorts of stuff there. Um, I think I've up to about 40 blogs on there for you to read. Um, they're all there as videos as well. So you can watch them rather than read them if that's your preference. And I do have a uh, podcast as well. You just need to search rheumatology.physio on uh, any podcast player. And um, that all the blogs are read out there as well, um, as well as any of these takeovers that I do. And um, you get all your information there and uh, in any sort of format that you like, so you don't just have to read. Um, I will be back in a month's time. So this is a normal slot for me now. So the third Tuesday of every month, um, if you can remember that, will be me. Um, and if anybody wants me to chew over any rheumatology topics, then please do get in touch. Getting some nice thank yous through from the chat. So uh, thank you to everybody who's sent me in these uh, these thank yous. That really means a lot. Um, I'm glad everybody's found it useful. And um, I'll see you in approximately one month's time, unless I see you on one of my courses or some other live stream or a podcast, which I'm recording plenty of those this week. Um, thank you for spending your lunch time with me. And um, I'll see you all soon. Um, and don't forget to turn the volume down with this ridiculously loud video that comes in at the end. Bye for now.